In the Scottish Highlands, where hatreds are as old as the hills, men die easier than feuds. Where clan fights clan, only one hatred can unite them, their hatred of the English. Against the odds, a band of warriors will help Scotland win its greatest victory and deal England one of its worst defeats. As the 14th century dawns, Scotland is at war with itself. Far from king or court, men settle quarrels with the sword. Clan MacDougall has taken arms against its rival, the Campbells. Their goal, the most prized possession in this bleak land. It is a triumph for Clan MacDougall, another defeat for Clan Campbell. They have lost a herd, and with it, much wealth. As the Campbell survivor flees for home, misery is a familiar companion. Once more, his clan has been beaten by their age-old enemy an insult they won't be quick to forget. But revenge will come sooner than they expect from an unlikely quarter. The Campbell's refuge lies in the peaks and folds of the Scottish Highlands. In the 1300s, it is a world apart. Mountains, locks and bogs set Highlanders off from the lowland Scots and the rest of Britain. Winters are ferocious, summers soaking. The soil sustains only the hardiest of creatures, and the people, as one lowlander complains, are as hard as the land. The Highlanders are a savage and untamed race, rude and independent. Even language divides the Scots. Lowlanders speak English, Highlanders Gaelic. All they have in common is a king. But to the Highlanders, marooned in their mountains, he is a distant figure indeed. For the Campbells of Argyll in the Western Highlands, their own strength is their only protection against their powerful neighbors, the MacDougalls of Lorne. United in hardship, families cling to the sturdiest rock in the land, the clan. At the heart of Clan Campbell stands Inisconnell Castle, home to their chief, Sir Neil Campbell. In Gaelic, clan means the children. Within Clan Campbell, many families live as one, sharing a common name. Even the poorest Campbell is welcomed in. Parted from his mother, he is raised in another household to ensure his ties to the clan will be the stronger bond.
Into the isolated life of the Campbells, change suddenly comes when a stranger arrives. In 1307, the Campbells are stunned by the appearance on their land of a Highlander they've never seen. Robert the Bruce in name, King of Scotland, but a king who has come begging to his subjects. He is a fugitive, charged with the murder of a rival for the crown. His pursuers are his victim's kin, none other than the Campbell's old enemy, the McDougals. The Campbells need no other reason to help their king. Within a year, with Campbells at his side, Bruce brings weaker clans under his control. One by one, they flock to his side. By 1308, just one clan holds out, the McDougals of Lorne. Backed by the English, they dare defy the king. The epic poem, The Bruce, records the story. Upon the north half of the Scottish sea, all obeyed his majesty, except the Lord of Lorne, and those that would with him go. He ever held against the king, and hated him above all things. With an old score to settle, the Campbell chieftain summons his men. Their ranks are swollen by broken men. Outlaws from their own clans, they have found a new home with the Campbells. Every man, Campbell by birth or by bond, will share the dangers of battle and the spoils. The summons to battle reaches the most remote Campbells. It's a two-day march to his chief's castle, yet the Highlander travels lightly. To go to war, first he needs the plaid, bedroll, blanket and battle attire all in one. Its deep folds offer a measure of protection from the cold and from the cold steel blade. Friend or foe might be clad in the same striped or checkered cloth. Centuries would pass before one clan distinguished its garb from another. Whatever the design, the men are clad in camouflage, the colors of the land around them. The poorest Campbells wear a lin, a plain linen shirt coated with grease or fat to make it waterproof. A small leather purse or sporan hangs from the waist. For most of the year, from his mid-thigh to his feet, the warrior wears nothing at all. In the bitter cold, Highlanders earn their lowlands nickname, Red Shanks. Dressed in their plaids, the Highlanders line up for their other requirement, their weapons. Most rely on their chief's armory. Fired by the chance for revenge and a share of the McDougal riches, the Campbells strike out into enemy territory. Lord. Their path takes them through a wild mountain landscape, the Pass of Brander. 
a sheer cliff plunging into Loch Awe. the Campbells confidently march deeper into hostile terrain. cliffs of Ben Cruachan, the MacDougalls lie in wait. The king and his men held their way, and when the pass had entered they, the folk of Lorne on high, upon the king they raised a cry, and shot and tumbled on him stones, both great and heavy, upon their heads. Minutes into the fight, the attackers are themselves attacked. Forewarned by a scout of the MacDougall's plan, Bruce had sent a detachment of archers ahead to scale the mountain and come up behind the enemy. Eagles find themselves fighting on two fronts. As each Highlander slashes, his claymore, his great sword, is a weapon of both offense and defense. His hands are protected behind sturdy guards sloping toward the blade. In the hands of any man strong enough to wield it, the Lock Arbor acts up to seven feet long. A Campbell hooks his foe, trips him, then turns the blade. When fighting is too close for swords, Men reach for their dirk, a foot-long dagger honed razor sharp. It is the warfare of the Highlands, mastery of weapons and brute strength. The Campbells turn ambush into victory. Now they fan out across Lorne, seizing cattle and land. The rest of the MacDougalls escape south toward England. One final reward falls into Campbell hands, Dunstaffnage, the MacDougall Castle. Yet the fighting has just begun, as the Highlanders brace for a greater threat. While clan was fighting clan, the English seized footholds in Scottish cities and castles. With all the clans now behind him, and the Campbells in the forefront of his army, Robert the Bruce begins to drive the English back. The Scots recapture castle after castle, Perth, Edinburgh, Roxburgh. By 1314, only one stronghold remains in English hands. 
Stirling Castle. Guarding the eastern frontier with England, it is known as the key to Scotland. Clans from all over Scotland stream to Bruce's side. The Campbells are surrounded by unfamiliar faces, old enemies, even lowlanders. 6,000 strangers united in hatred of the English. Against them, Edward II, the English king, sends a force three times their number. It won't be a fair fight. The English have the advantage of armored knights. The Scots can afford nothing like them. Such horses cost a fortune. Upon them rides another fortune in armor and weapons. Scottish hopes rest on supreme discipline and a simple piece of wood. It is a new formation, the Shiltron, or Shield Troop, a phalanx armed with shields and axes and 14-foot pikes. Even an armored horseman would hesitate to approach this forest of steel. And at full charge, horse and rider would be impaled for weeks, the Campbells drill, learning to wheel, to reverse, to advance as one across the battlefield. A thorny hedge of defense suddenly turns to the attack. It is a new discipline for the Campbells, a far cry from the unruly warfare of the Highlands, and a surprise for the English when they reach Stirling. When the battle opens, Scottish pikes force Edward's knights off the field and into a marsh. His horses and his attack bog down. Camping in the marsh, Edward plans to retake the field the next day and crush the Scots under a thousand hooves. That night, the Campbells hear a rousing speech from their king. They have come here, trusting in their great power, to seek us in our own land, and have brought here, right into our hands, riches in such great plenty, that the poorest of you shall be both rich and mighty thereby. He gives them a grand cause to fight for, a free Scotland, and one just as dear to their hearts, English loot. While the English sleep, the Highlanders gird for battle. At dawn, the English are still camped on the marsh, and there the Highlanders surprise them. The Campbells take their positions alongside Bruce's pikemen. To the sound of bullhorns, Bruce leads his children forward. As the wall of pikes bears down, some of the English knights charge with more eagerness than wisdom.
confusion of battle, the English archers, with the teeth of their army, are trapped at the rear, useless, unable to fire without hitting their own knights. The Scots drive the English deeper into the marsh, fighting on familiar soil for their own land. The Highlanders press home their advantage. With all their might and all their main, they laid on as if mad. And such heavy blows with axes gave the heads and helmets they did cleave. So great a din was there of blows, as weapons upon armor struck, and of spears so great a breaking, with such throwing and such thrusting, such grinning, groaning, and so great a noise that no other can beat. And war cries shouted on every side, giving and taking of wounds wide, that it was hideous to hear. So many horses and knights lay drowned, it was said, that a man could pass over the stream called the Bannock Burn without wetting his feet. When the Battle of Bannock Burn was over, the lowly Highlanders and their fellow Scots had defeated the cream of English aristocracy, its knights. 700 pairs of spurs were displayed in triumph. During the entire Middle Ages, Bannockburn was the worst defeat the English ever suffered. As the Highlanders returned home, they carried with them three trophies, English plunder, a newfound pride, and a giant step toward keeping Scotland free. Yet the war wasn't over. Fourteen more years of bloodshed would pass before England would acknowledge the new king to the north, Robert the Bruce. His friends and allies, the Campbells of Argyle, would become one of the most powerful clans in the Highlands for their part in freeing a nation, Scotland. 